Good morning. <coughs> Welcome to Federated Church on this second Sunday of the Easter season, this uh, Solar Eclipse Eve, which I just realized is an acronym of S-E-E, -E, which means we will be able to see it. The <laughs> clouds will be gone. I think this is an omen. <coughs> we gather today here to listen for a whisper of God's grace as we seek wisdom in God's call to us and God's call to this church. At the heart of it all is God's indomitable grace that holds us all close always in life and in death. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. I'd like to invite you to sign in to our hospitality book. If you are in person here in the sanctuary, to sign that book, which is at the end of each pew on the center aisle. If you're joining us by live stream, we have two ways you could sign in and let us know of your presence. One is in the chat space of the live stream. The second is by sending an email to brookstrong at bstrong at fedchurch.org. We would love to know of your presence as well. And for those of you who are at home and would like to celebrate the sacrament of communion with us, we will be celebrating that later in the service, and you may want to gather the elements for that if you haven't done so already. Beginning April 24th, Betsy Wooster will be leading a book study, on a, bo a four-week book study on a book by Susan Pitchford called The Sacred Gaze. The book explores healing, spirituality, and contemplative prayer. You can sign up for that beginning uh, today in Fellowship Hall, or you can go on to fedchurch.org slash events and sign up for it there. I'd like now to invite forward Allison Graves, Dawn Dole, Katie swanson Harbage, and Bill Franz to make announcements. I'm here to announce a very exciting opportunity that we have for young families in the church and also in the community. Um, Beth Rakowski has met with the Sugar and Falls PTO and they've come up with a three-part series. We had the previous one um, a couple weeks ago and this is the second. And for those of you who don't know, um, the speaker is Lisa Damore, who is one of my favorite authors. She has written three best-selling books. She's amazing to hear live. Um, she has one-liners to be able to talk to teens and respond that just will blow your mind, and it's so simple. Um, she is going to be at the Performing Arts Center at the high school, at Sugar Falls High School, at the PAC Center, this Wednesday at 7, and it's a free event. It's open to all parents in the community. Your kids do not have to go to Sugar and Schools. Um, and we're really, really excited about this. Um, so please come join. If your grandparents of teenagers also come join, you'll understand them a little bit better. Um, so yes, thanks so much, and thanks to Beth. Good morning. Um, here at Federated Church, we've designated April as Earth Month, and SJAM, the Social Justice Advocacy Ministry Team, and the Committee Focused on Creation, Care, and Justice have planned some wonderful programs. We hope all of you will find something that piques your interest. Within the UCC, the Ministry of Environmental Justice is an integral part of our faith community. Together, we're working to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. On Sunday, April 21st, during the worship service, we will announce our new UCC designation as a Creation Justice Church. Very exciting. We hope you join us that day. Our monthly SJAM movie is Common Ground. This documentary won an award as a film that best exemplifies solution-oriented environmental storytelling. The film shows how people from different walks of life, different political backgrounds, and different places share one thing in common— the very soil beneath their feet, and why we should work to restore it. After the film, we have a guest joining us for conversation and questions, Mark Wise, owner of Native Landscapes and Gardens. He will share with us the importance of planting native in order to help our environment. So join us for our movie night on Monday, April 22nd, which is actually Earth Day, and it's going to be at the Family Life Center. I think the slide said Fellowship Hall, but we changed it to the Family Life Center at 7 o'clock p.m., and then on Sunday, April 28th, so towards the end of the month at 4 o'clock, we meet at South Chagrin Reservation for our quarterly Worship with Nature gathering, which will begin at 4.30. It's a family-friendly gathering to spend time in nature, experiencing the glory of God's creation, being grateful and in awe of this creation. With music, readings, and nature walk, and various ways to appreciate what God has given us, 
we join together in praise. Please join us there outdoors Sunday afternoon and invite your friends and family too. All are welcome. And lastly, we have a fun little calendar for each day in April. This invites you to do something every day that supports and helps the people, plants, and animals that inhabit this gift from God. You can pick up your copy of the calendar at the Angel Desk or find it on the church website. You'll see all these and more announcements in the bulletin in the coming weeks, on the church website later this week, and on Realm. And Katie's got a couple more things she's going to talk about related to our Creation Care and Justice event. Thank you. I am a very contented cow, free-ranging it with pigs and crazy chickens. Did you know that free-range chickens and their eggs are more nutritious? Something about their diet. Maybe all those yummy worms. Anyway, we all live on Broken Yoke Ranch, an organic farm owned by Daryl Kendall, a Kenston grad. They employ folks who have struggled in life. Think prison, addiction, and other difficulties. But on our farm, they seem to thrive while learning new work skills. It's an amazing place. Daryl is coming to speak to you on Wednesday, April 17th. An organic taco dinner starts at 6 p.m., and he speaks at 7, all in Fellowship Hall. It's a wondrous Wednesday event. Then come see me at the Broken Yoke Farm Tour on Saturday, April 28th. Meet in the church parking lot at 10 a.m. and drive together. Or just show up. The tour starts at 11, and they have a yummy farm store. So sign up downstairs or on Realm for Daryl and dinner. Then sign up for the farm tour with your kids. It's family friendly, like me. As Dawn says, there are many announcements in the bulletin, and you should check those out to see uh, if you have to get details on those. Reveling in mystery and grace and holy opportunity, let us now worship God. Thank you. 
invite you to stand in spirit or in body and share together in the responsive call to worship. The joy of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is with us. Even though we hear words of doubt, we are called to believe. Even Thanks be to Christ who gives us the victory. Alleluia. Alleluia. I invite you in the beauty and glory of this day to with beauty and glory pass the peace of Christ to one another. Peace. Wonderful way to frame it.
We learn the lessons of generosity from our greatest teacher, Jesus. Giving to the poor, supporting the disenfranchised, advocating for those who need allies. These are the teachings and the living examples that Jesus showed us through his ministry. Through our own generosity, we live in the light of Christ, who showed us and continues to show us the way. The morning offering will now be given and received.
Let us pray. What a morning it is indeed, gracious God. What a day. What a privilege it is to have life on this planet, this incredible gift that you have given us. And so we offer you these, our gifts, in gratitude. May they be agents of healing and love in this community and beyond. In your name, amen. shared with us, we are celebrating Earth and Creation Care this month of April, and in so doing, we have an affirmation of Creation Care printed in your bulletin, and I invite you now to join me in saying this affirmation together. We see God's generosity in the glory of creation and the natural resources God has provided. We acknowledge and accept our role in caring for the earth and its people. We affirm that all of creation is a gift from God, and as God's children, we are called to make living life on this gift we call earth safe and healthy for all people everywhere. We show our gratefulness for God when we show love to the earth. And with sincerity, of faith and a surety of heart, let us pray. O God of sun and moon and stars, light of our world, brightly shining hope of this Easter season, we praise your power and your beauty, your strength and your mercy. Your spirit burns with warmth and passion and we receive it with gratitude. You are present to us in the risen Christ, who is life to all the world. May we give testimony to his resurrection in what we say and do. Hear the prayers we lift to you this morning of hope and faith. May your healing touch surround Lynn Kessel, who is hospitalized after a fall on Friday. And for Lynn Goodman, who is recovering from surgery, who broke her ankle after a fall this past week. For Leon Haddix, as he recovers from knee replacement surgery. For Polly Mankey, following the death of her father, Eugene Grievish, on March 31st. And this month, we pray for our mission partners, Medwish International. We pray for staff members today, Kristen Lefebvre and Marty Culberson. May your love enfold all those we have named and all those whom we do not know who need your healing care. Hold them close, O God. Heal them. Send your comfort and care among those who are hurting this day, among those who suffer hunger, among those whose daily lives are struggles greater than others realize. Hear our hopes for healing and hear our cries for justice. We long for a world in which no one must suffer for the things that so many take for granted. We long for you to make what seems impossible a reality. Bring your peace to our far-off neighbors in Ukraine and Russia. Bring your peace and aid to your people in Gaza and Israel. And give the wisdom and courage for an end to war and ways for aid, food, medical care, shelter. In the days ahead, so many people will look to the sky, O oh God. People who share little in common of religious faith, or political ideals will all look toward the eclipse of the sun with wonder and awe for this solar system of our shared home. And as we do, we thank you for the gift of the wonders in the heavens, the warmth of this sun, 
and the gratitude for life that unites us. We hold before you all that gives rise to our gratitude and all that gives rise to our concerns and our hope. And we offer these prayers to you in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Today's gospel reading takes off from where we left off at the end of the Easter Sunday reading last week after Mary has gone to the tomb and encountered Jesus and then gone back to tell the other disciples and that's where we take up now. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Having said this, Jesus showed them Jesus' hands and sighed. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As God has sent me, so I send you. Having said this, Jesus breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in Jesus' hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in Jesus' side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, 
my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the child of God, and that through believing you may have life in Jesus' name. Let us pray. May your word, O God, be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Amen. History has not been kind to Thomas, one of the first disciples of Jesus. He has been forever pegged by those who have heard this story as doubting Thomas, as though he is the doubter beyond all doubters, and frankly, as though this is some kind of character flaw in him. The truth, though, is that doubt is familiar to all of us. And it's not as though there's something wrong with us if we have some doubt. If I tell you Caitlin Clark is going to score 60 points in this afternoon's NCAA Women's Championship basketball game, you will likely say, I doubt it. Although she could do that. If on a normal day, a day other than tomorrow, in other words, if I tell you the moon is going to block the rays of the sun in the middle of the day, you would perfectly reasonably say, I doubt it. And you would stand yourself in perfectly good stead to doubt both of those predictions. If, though, I had said to you centuries ago that the earth revolves around the sun and not vice versa, or that the universe contains billions of galaxies, you would likely have expressed your doubt and you would have been wrong. Sometimes our doubts are barometers of truth, and sometimes they are way off the mark. Doubt itself, though, is not a bad thing. Doubt is part of the way we process and understand the world. Copernicus doubted the way Ptolemy understood what he saw in the heavens and suggested that the earth was not the center of the universe. And look at the leap in understanding that doubt engendered. That was a wildly productive doubt. When it comes to today's story about the one we know as Doubting Thomas, though, casual readers almost invariably think the story is saying there's something wrong with this disciple who seems to demand proof. Most people just assume that Thomas is the only one of the disciples who doubts, that the rest come to faith without the slightest hesitation and that Thomas's apparent unbelief is some sort of moral failing. I suspect that's not at all what the story is trying to tell us, though. Remember, the whole story that we've just read, including the Easter story from last Sunday, Mary Magdalene runs into the resurrected Christ and doesn't recognize her Savior at all. When the risen Christ calls her by name, she is suddenly shocked into awareness. She then goes and tells the other disciples about the one she has seen. So those first disciples, the ones who haven't been to the tomb, know, they know from Mary that Jesus has been raised. And yet here they are at the beginning of this scene, the disciples minus Thomas locked in a room, petrified of the religious authorities. Mary has told them that Jesus lives, and still they were as frightened as they could be if they were watching a horror movie. In other words, they totally doubt what Mary has told them. All of them doubt her. And then they encounter this risen Jesus themselves, and they're reassured. They're so comforted that they virtually leap in joy. Not, though, because they believe what Mary has told them. They doubted until they saw this embodied risen Christ. So Thomas is no different from any of the other disciples. Just as the other disciples don't believe Mary, so Thomas doesn't believe those other disciples. They're all in the same boat. 
they're all doubters. <laughs> They've heard something that seems nonsensical, so they don't believe it. And this is not a character flaw. It's a gift. This questioning, this wondering, this holding up what they've heard as though it's a kind of diamond with countless facets and they're trying to plumb its depths. To doubt, to doubt is essentially to explore. It's what the first group of disciples does. It's what Thomas does. And if we're alive and engaged, it's what we do. It would be absurd, for example, to tell scientists they were not supposed to doubt. It's not just Copernicus doubting Ptolemy, it's Einstein doubting Newton. It's Darwin and Mendel and Curie and Bohr doubting theories that no longer add up in their minds. Theoretical scientists hugely expand human understanding precisely because of the doubts they bring to bear. And religious doubts are just as generative as scientific doubts. It was Frederick Buechner who said, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you don't have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts, he said, are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. Those doubts are how we grow in our understanding of what is ultimately mystery. Over a century ago, William James, in his seminal book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, suggested that there's something more to life than what we can see and hear and taste and touch and smell. He, in fact, called this other dimension the more, M-O-R-E. I treasure that oddly simple way of putting it that James articulated. There's something more to life than what we perceive with our senses, but it is extremely difficult to pin down, to understand, to conceptualize. So we search and we explore and we try to put words to the ineffable. And it's that searching, it's that questioning, it's that doubting that gives us at least a glimpse of comprehension. When I was a child, I was convinced that God was the great magician in the sky, the one who would grant what I wanted if only I prayed intensely and sincerely enough. So I would pray for a red bicycle, or I would pray to make the varsity basketball team. I had no idea at that time in my life that God wasn't in the business of doling out the things and desires I craved. If you were like me, and you had a similar understanding, and if you were finally going to continue as a person of faith, then you had to doubt. And eventually, you had to see another way. You had to say to yourself, my wishes are not coming true. God is not showing up the way I thought God was going to show up, the way I wanted God to show up. So something else must be going on here. What is it? Either you wrestle with those doubts and try to find another way, or you end up giving up on faith entirely. Most of us sense that there's some more out there or in here, and the only way we can get at that more is by questioning, examining, exploring, and doubting the overly facile way faith so often gets presented and that so often gets presented to us when we're children. A few years ago, Duke University theologian Kate Bowler wrote a book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. <laughs> Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. In it, she says explicitly, that not everything happens for a reason. A child dying in the car wreck, Israeli hostages taken and citizens killed by Hamas, the unconscionable bombing of Gaza by Israel, the family erased by the tornado, the children abused by their parents or 
teachers or pastors. Something is deeply out of whack if we insist there's some divine reason for that sort of atrocity. There isn't. There isn't. It's just awful. There is simply no reason for that, at least not a holy reason, who could possibly worship a God so capricious, so callous, so cruel as to be causing such things to happen. So that means if we're going to worship, if we're going to develop a deeper and truer sense of that more, we have to doubt the God we've been presented or the God we've thought we were supposed to believe in. Not everything happens for a reason, at least not a good reason. Some things are just gruesome, and there's no trite and easy way to explain them. All we can do is sit silently with those who suffer in witness to their pain. It's only by doubting that sort of too easy formula that we can grow into a deeper way of seeing this more. What we find as we question and doubt the notion of a God who is there to fulfill our every wish is instead the God we see and know in Jesus. This God isn't a magician performing tricks or a server taking our order. This God is the one who has created this magnificently stunning universe. It's the God who walks with us when we're in pain, the God who accompanies us in our struggles, the God who shares a meal with us in our hunger, the God who has blessed us with a love that can leave us breathless and bring us to our knees. This is the one who reminds us that no matter what happens, in that familiar phrase of Julian of Norwich, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Ultimately, we can never prove the richness and grace of this accompanying God in our lives. That ethereal and reassuring presence lies, of course, far beyond any sort of definitive scientific demonstration. The truth, though, is that all of what really matters in life lies beyond observable proof. I couldn't possibly prove to you why I am moved to the core by a Mozart opera or why you may be thrilled by a Taylor Swift song or a Van Gogh painting or a Miyazaki film or the Cleveland skyline at sunset. And even more strikingly, there is no way I could prove my love for Mary or our children or our grandchildren or you. There is no proving how or why any of those things touches us. They just do. And it's the same with faith. The more at the heart of the universe, the very one we see embodied in the risen Christ somehow grasps us. This Christ sits with us in the examining room as we await test results. This Christ thrills with us at the marriage proposal. This Christ tends to us when the college admissions news is not what we had hoped. This Christ rejo rejoices with us at the remission of the disease. This Christ stands vigil with us as we approach the imminent death. The very Christ who comes to those early disciples in their alarm and worry is the Christ who comes to us in the locked rooms of our anxiety and fear and walks our journeys with us. The odd thing is that we think the story we heard earlier is centrally about the disciples and their doubt and anxiety. And we think it's a story about us with all our questions and fears. And we think the story is trying to tell us something about how we should be handling our doubt and anxiety. 
That's not really what this story is, though. Or it's not primarily that. It's really a story not so much about us as it is about Jesus. It's a story about the Christ who adores us, even and maybe especially when all seems lost. The Christ who appears to spark our hope and our love. And ultimately, it's about the Jesus who knows that that love is at the heart of everything. If Christ loves disciples enough to accompany them in their lives, then we're bid to do the same with each other. Some time ago, I visited a woman in the hospital who was dying, and next to her sat her eight-year-old granddaughter. The girl was sitting silently at the bedside, holding her grandmother's hand. And it was gorgeous, a love so deep and full and present that I stood in wonder at the holy ground on which I was standing, the risen Christ, there, in person. And doubt vanished, and everything was fresh and alive. Thanks be to the more, the one we call God, for grace that transforms doubt and for love that conquers death and makes all things new. Amen. invited to this communion table, the largest table in the world, as there has always been more than enough room for each of us here. At this table of remembrance, the love and transforming grace of Jesus Christ is openly offered. At this table of remembrance, our broken lives are made whole. At this table of remembrance, we give thanks for God's redemption and for God's forgiveness. Blessed are those, said Jesus, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so let us come to the table expectant, eager, open to tasting the rich blessings of heaven born from unexpected places and people and experiences. In this meal, we remember the life, death, and resurrection of the one who still takes on flesh among us today. As we remember the night when Jesus shared the Passover meal with his followers, he took bread, gave thanks for it, blessed it, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shared for you with, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We will be receiving communion by intinction, and when all is ready, you will receive first a piece of bread and then you will dip it into the cup in order to consume both elements together. Or you may choose the prepackaged uh, elements in these baskets. There are both regular and gluten-free bread options to be shared, and I invite you to come forward down the side aisles and return to your seat by the way of the center aisle. 
for any of those who you may need, may need to remain seated, we will gladly bring the elements to you. When Jesus first offered this meal, he shared it with one who would doubt him, one who would deny him, one who would betray him, and every single one of the rest would abandon him that very night. The love of God does not depend on the state of our belief or our goodness. Surely God is ready to give this meal to us, however we may come to the table. At Federated Church, our communion ministry extends beyond those who are here today in person to all those who may be joining us from home. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all those for whom Christ gave his life. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all is ready.
invite you to stand and let us say together the prayer taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, on earth earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give Give us this day our daily bread, and and forgive us our sins, as as we forgive forgive those who sin against us. And And lead us not into temptation, but but deliver us from from evil. For thine thine is the kingdom, and the the power, and the the glory glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. we go forth from here to entertain our doubts and to trust, to trust that we will never be alone, that the risen Christ walks with us and sits with us and eats with us and is with us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with us all always. Amen. You may be seated. (laughs) 